Former Idaho Governor Phil Batt will be laid to rest today. A public funeral for Batt just a few minutes from starting in Boise at the Cathedral of the Rockies. The governor will be buried in Wilder during a private ceremony for just family and friends later in the day. He passed away last Saturday on his 96th birthday. We've heard from state and nonprofit leaders for a week now about his influence on this state that he absolutely loved so much. He served as the 29th governor of Idaho from 95 all the way to 1999 during a ceremony yesterday to honor the governor, one of many in this past week. The four governors who served after Governor Bat shared memories and spoke about his legacy here in the Gem State. I wish all future leaders could take a lesson from this man. Take the long view. The political of our state and our country has always and always will ebb and flow. But regardless of the issues at hand, Governor Bat demonstrated how you do business doesn't have to change all that much. Listen, work together, compromise, but don't lose sight of your principles. Great words there from our current governor on the former governor, Phil Bad. Inside the cathedral right now, they've just brought in Governor Bat's family there sitting down, uh, standing right now. They're just about to get underway. A uh, little bit more on Bat now. He was born March 4th, 1927 on a farm near Wilder. Again, that's where he will be buried later today in a cemetery there in Wilder. After graduating from Wilder High School, he served in the Army Air Forces near the end of World War II. Bat later studied chemical engineering right here in this state at the University of Idaho. He had a reputation as a man of wit, wisdom, and decency, and also as a fiscal conservative, but also a champion of fairness and human rights. Well, Governor Batt helped establish a 1995 agreement with the federal government over the removal of spent fuel and nuclear waste from what's now the Idaho National Laboratory, one of his great legacies there. And although the deal has been changed several times, it remains in effect to this day. He also pushed for legislation to cover farm workers under the state's workers' compensation program. While in the legislature, again, where he also served this community and this state that he loved so much, Bat sponsored legislation to establish the Idaho Human Rights Commission all the way back in 1969. Current members of the Human Rights Commission issued a statement recognizing Bat for his efforts to create the commission and throughout his career with his tireless efforts to ensure equality for all Idahoans. In fact, the new education center at the Walsmith Center for Human Rights in Boise, now under construction, is going to be named the Phil E. Bat Building in his honor. In his obituary, Governor Bat's family says he would wish that memorial contributions be directed to the Walsmith Center. Governor Bat died peacefully at home, according to a statement from Governor Little's office. They also issued a statement saying that Governor Bat was the epitome of a public servant, a lot of what we just talked about right there, having served as governor, lieutenant governor, senator. His legacy is distinguished by his unrelenting human rights leadership, determined fiscal conservatism, and enduring love of Idaho. And again, you see that throughout his life, continuing to serve this community and this state. Governor Little went on to say it's fitting that Phil Batt was born and passed on Idaho Day this past Saturday, the celebration of the anniversary of the day that President Abraham Lincoln created the Idaho Territory in 1863. This again from Governor Little saying that Teresa and I send our love and condolences to his wife, Fran C. There you see her being led in right now, his children and many friends. Governor Little said at the conclusion of his statement, four years ago, Bat was awarded the state's top honor, the 2019 Idaho Medal of Achievement. He was the third person in history to receive that medal, only the third, which was presented to him by former Governor C.L. Butch Otter and former Idaho Supreme Court Chief Justice Linda Koppeltrap. You see they're just about ready to get underway here with this funeral for former Governor Phil Batt. Let's hear a little bit more about Governor Batt's legacy. The ceremony of the circumstance. From the State House steps. To the skies above.
a former governor lying in state, can seem a solemn affair. I would rather be ashes than dust. Didn't that sound like Phil Bat? But for those who came to honor the former onion farmer. I would rather that my spark should burn out in a brilliant blaze than it should be stifled in dry rot. The former governor, Phil Bat. The proper function of man is to live, not to exist. I shall not waste my days in trying to prolong them. I shall use my time. God bless Phil. The weight of the moment could be felt in the emotion of the memories. Governor Batts, long-standing service as a citizen, legislator, lieutenant governor, governor, and the many roles he played is marked by many achievements. I wish all future leaders could take a lesson from this man. Take the long view. When people describe Phil Bat, Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And I know that God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus replied, Martha, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I understand that on the last day. And Jesus said, Martha, I am the resurrection. I am the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, yet will they live. Friends, we've gathered together today to praise God, to witness to our faith, and to celebrate Governor Phil Batt's life. We come together acknowledging our grief, feeling our loss, and we ask God to be present with us that in the midst of this time, we can find grace. Let us pray together. Pray with me. Holy and knowing God, we gather in this unique moment, this moment of loss, this moment of hope. We gather in honor and in celebration of your child. We gather to witness to our faith. We gather acknowledging our grief and remembering a life well lived. God, as memories and tears and laughter and peace flood our minds, in this tender time, would you hold us? Would you comfort us? Would you grant us grace that in our pain we find comfort, in our sorrow, hope, and in our celebration and remembrance of death, we are reminded of resurrection. Thanks be to God. Amen. Throughout the centuries, in the midst of moments like this, people have turned to Holy Scripture and they've said, God, could you speak a word? Could you speak a word of hope to us? Hear these words from the Holy Scriptures, from the writings of Paul, the Apostle Paul to the church in Rome. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble, hardship, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, sword? No, in all things we are more than conquerors through God who loves us. Paul writes, for I'm convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither things present nor in the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation is able to separate us from the love of God that's found in Christ Jesus our Lord. And of course, hear these words from the psalmist. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. You lead me in the paths of righteousness for your namesake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup runs over. Surely, goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. 
this time we continue the celebration of life, Eva Gay is going to come and share in the obituary. Philip E. Batt, farmer, musician, writer, and Idaho's 29th governor, died on his 96th birthday, March 4, 2023. He was the youngest of five children born to John Batt and Elizabeth Carn Batt, who farmed at Wilder. Batt began working on the farm at age of seven, and his family appreciated his innate work ethic, along with his sunny personality. He played the violin and the clarinet, liked to sing, and relished life on the farm and in town with his siblings and friends. He was very social. After his two brothers joined the Army during World War II, he joined the Army Air Corps at the age of 17. He was called to active duty when he was 18, just six months before the end of the war in Japan. He had completed his basic training in Mississippi and in later years vividly recalled encountering appalling racial segregation during that time, an experience that inspired his career-long support for civil and human rights issues. His desire to dignify marginalized people solidified and expanded as he recognized that changes were needed closer at home bettering the conditions of the Idaho farm workers. He believed in the dignity of all, and he believed in the democratic process. Early in his political career, at the end of a grueling hop harvest, he jumped up on a flatbed truck to thank his farm workers and to encourage them to go vote. Through the efforts of his foreman, Manuel Zamora, who was interpreting into Spanish, Bat exhorted his exhausted crew to go vote that fall. I don't care who you vote for. I don't care if you vote for me or not. But you have the right to vote as much as anybody in this country, so go vote. Later, as a legislator, he sponsored the bill creating the Idaho Human Rights Commission and last year, the Boise-based Wasmuth Center for Human Rights Education announced that it would name its soon-to-be-completed education building, the Philip E. Batt Building. Upon his return from military service, he enrolled at the University of Idaho. Using his GI stipend, he formed a dance band and studied chemical engineering. After two years, his father's illness forced him to leave school and return to the family farm to work. He grew onions and hops for many years in Wilder, and at age 36 was the youngest person ever elected to the National Hop Association. While at the university, he met Jackie Fallis, and they were married in 1948. They were married for 66 years until her death in 2014. He and Jackie had three children, William, Rebecca, and Leslie Ann. The family enjoyed life on the farm, which included a menagerie of pets and many Sunday outings to nearby mountains with friends and family for picnics and fishing. Phil Batt loved Idaho. His brother John had been elected to the Idaho House of Representatives, and after John decided not to seek re-election, Phil ran for office in 1964 and won, beginning 16 years in the Idaho legislature and included being elected majority leader and president pro tempore of the Senate. In 1978, he was elected lieutenant governor in 1984, he was again elected to the Senate, resigning in 1987 when Governor Andrus appointed him to the Idaho Board of Transportation. The Department of Transportation named its headquarters building after him in 2013. In 1990, Bat was elected chair of the Idaho Republican Party. 
He often said he believed in the big tent concept of his party and focused on finding good candidates to run for office. After scouting for gubernatorial candidates for the 1994 election, Batt decided to run himself and was successful. Taking office on a snowy day in 1995, he later quipped that this was the cold day which some of his detractors had predicted <laughs> if he ever won the chief executive spot. Batt's four years as governor were highlighted by his unwavering support for human rights, including his decision to become his own liaison to Idaho's Native American tribes, expanding workers' compensation to include farm workers, and establishing the governor's Hispanic initiative to recognize Idaho's fastest growing minority. In 2019, Governor Otter, assisted by Governor-elect Little, presented Bat with the Idaho Medal of Achievement Award, Idaho's highest honor. Although he easily would have won a second term, Bat left political office after four years, saying he believed in self-imposed term limits. But he was much more than a politician. He was a writer who wrote poetry, music, newspaper columns, and two books, The Complete Phil Bat, A Kaleidoscope, and Life is a Geezer. He was a musician who played clarinet with jazz icons Gene Harris, Lionel Hampton, Curtis Stigers, and many others, including Chet Atkins. Often in collaboration with Marguerite Lawrence, he also took his clarinet to play alongside elementary school bands and orchestras any time they visited the State House Rotunda. He was a witty punster who loved animals and who kept a pet minor bird that had an interesting vocabulary in his State Senate office. Phil went on to enjoy his retirement living at Willow Park Retirement Center for a time. Even though he characterized himself as a terrible golfer, he continued weekly golf games for years with a large group of friends who could never break the code of the governor's scoring system. <laughs> he also enjoyed the tradition of bat staff lunches at Yen Ching for years after leaving office, especially on his birthday. Phil met and in 2015 married Francie Riley they made their home in Boise and enjoyed travel, golf outings, neighborhood gatherings centered around music, and family celebrations. Phil developed strong connections with Francie's children and grandchildren. He is survived by his wife Francie, his children William James Batt and his wife Kathy Noggle, Rebecca Sue Batt and Leslie Ann Batt Corbett along with a number of beloved grandchildren, great-grandchildren, cousins, nephews, nieces, and, and on, on both his and Francie's side. At an event honoring him in 2019, Governor Otter said, Phil Batt is a rare leader who transcends political ideology. Today, more than ever before, Idaho needs more leaders like Phil Bad. Well, I want to thank the family, staff, loved ones uh, for the lovely Lion State ceremony we had yesterday. I particularly appreciate the military division for all their work they did in a constrained time frame. Yesterday, as we were waiting on the steps for the flyover, 
a small flock of geese went over the yard and Francie quipped, well, there's the flyover. And I said something about Phil would appreciate the cheaper version. And both Rebecca and Leslie agreed. So uh, I also want to clarify one detail from the comments that uh, Governor Otter and I stated, excuse me, Reverend, about uh, Phil Batt's butt chewings, that they were in private. But there may be just special treatment that Butch and I got because afterwards Jim Yost came up to me and said, sure glad the two of you got in private butt chewings. Mine were always in public. <laughs> in fact, Jim said that towards the end of Governor Batt's reign, he gave him a certificate for going 50 days without a butt chewing. So, <laughs> Jim, that's because he loved you. So, uh, anyway, I do want to thank everybody for everything that's taken place since a week ago. It's been a, it's been a fast pace, and, and Eva Gay, uh, you and Francie have had to do a lot, and we all appreciate that. Another tribute of, to Phil that has gained some notoriety uh, was we, we still celebrated uh, Phil's birthday on Saturday. And in preparation for that, not knowing that Phil wouldn't be with us that day, uh, we wrote, our office wrote a old geezer tightwad day proclamation. It, it was, there was a lot of truth in it, and a lot of it referred to these used to be young staffers that are in this segment and I don't see many young people there now. I don't know what happened. I, I don't know what happened to that, but uh, uh, I am certain that uh, tightwad geezer, Phil would be happy with that moniker. Um, Besides his book was titled Geezer that he wrote, he, he authored. I mentioned it before, and we'll touch on it again, about it's truly remarkable that all of this happened on March 4th on Idaho Day. As you know, Idaho Day is celebrating the anniversary of the day Abraham Lincoln created the Idaho Territory in 1863, and this year was our 160th anniversary. My predecessor, Governor Otter, signed the bill in 2014 creating Idaho Day. Phil's birth and passing on Idaho Day is so fitting because the spirit of Lincoln seems to run through Phil's accomplishments and everything he stood for. Just as Lincoln's biggest legacy was the elimination of slavery because he felt strongly that all men should be able to enjoy the fruits of their labor, so did Phil. Phil was all about opportunity. Whether it was his work in elevating human rights during a dark time in our state's history, or the advancements he made for farm workers, his accomplishments got to the heart of what America is all about, that every man is created equal and should be treated equally under the law. Phil's life, both public and private, serve as the standard for what it means to be an Idahoan. Whenever we need a reminder of what true leadership is, we should look to Phil Bat. I am truly honored and blessed to have known this person and even more honored to have his leadership. God bless you, Governor. Had I known I was going to be following the sitting governor, I probably wouldn't have been so confident to uh, volunteer for this. <clears throat> uh, also, interesting weather. I think it's unique that maybe Idaho's a little upset today as well as us. My name is Jake Corbett. I am one of Phil's grandsons. My mom is Leslie, Phil's youngest daughter. <clears throat> I'm truly honored that I was asked to speak here today but also very intimidated. I mean, how do you compress 96 years of greatness into a five minute speech? The answer is you don't. So in true Phil Bat fashion, I'm going to keep this short and sweet. I think probably everyone here is aware that Phil was a unique breed, a common man with an uncommon drive. He was kind, gentle, and had a huge heart. He always saw the best in people. Phil was living proof that 
one person can truly make a difference in another person's life. When Phil was governor, I was a teenager, and as teenagers tend to do, I had a little run-in with the law. I did not want to tell my grandfather slash governor about this incident, but my mother convinced me to. So one day during a visit in his office, I, embarrassed and ashamed, told him the story. And when I finally found the courage to look him in the eye, he was just smirking. He kind of chuckled and said, well, Jacob, there's only been one man who was perfect who walked this earth, and you know what? We killed him. <laughs> Don't beat yourself up, just learn from it. My grandfather was a good man. He lived his life by a pretty simple code. No matter what you do, you work hard. You treat others exactly the way you wish to be treated. If it's broke and you're capable, fix it. If you're in a position to help someone, you help them. There wasn't a lot of gray to him. It was right or wrong, not much in between. He taught me also you could learn a lot from an individual and how they treated animals. And I found that to be a pretty accurate statement. Phil put a great deal of faith in people. He trusted and believed in them, even when they couldn't see it themselves. He was an honest guy, 99.9% .9 of the time. If you ever golfed with him, you know what 0.1% I'm talking about. <laughs> Besides honesty, I admired his courage. The dude was barely the size of my leg, yet absolutely fearless. Bravery that most of us can't even fathom. And he despised bullies. Phil never really saw himself as a politician. He saw himself as a common man who was just trying to give back to a state and it's people who he loved and had given him so much. Something that just re I, I just recently found out was during his time as governor, there were several mornings he would come into the Capitol, and we're talking like early, early, when no one else was around, and he'd take a moment in that long hallway outside of his office, and he'd kind of say out loud, thank you, I'm so humbled by the people of this state, thank you. I thought that was worth sharing. Now that we've spoken about how awesome my grandpa was, I'd like to tell you a story of something that Phil did not excel in, and that was driving. <laughs> I only rode in the vehicle with my grandpa one time that I can remember. I don't know if I was with him much as a young child, but if I was, my parents were very irresponsible. <laughs> we were in Sun Valley for the Governor's Cup. I think it was 97. My cousin Max and I somehow got roped into riding with grandma and grandpa back to the hotel from supper. Max had skied there the past year and was pointing up at the mountain, talking about the different runs, and Grandpa was also looking up there, pointing up. I wasn't really paying attention until an oncoming, oncoming vehicle flew by while laying on their horn. Grandpa waved and said, yes, hello. <laughs> he turned back to inform Max and myself, we get a lot of waves because of the license plate being number one. I can tell you right now, that is not the reason people were honking. <laughs> Plus, it was dark out. They could not see the license plate. Luckily, traffic was light, only a couple more honks and a couple more, yes, hello, and we were back to the hotel. They say farmers are awful drivers because they're never looking out their windshield. They're always looking at the crops through the side windows. Well, my grandfather might have inadvertently started that stereotype many years ago. I love my grandpa. I will truly miss him. Our visits, our conversations, but truth be told, I'm relieved he's no longer suffering. When I say suffering, it's not that he was in pain or anything like that, but look at the life that man led. He was 100% driven from having purpose for helping and serving others. And I might be wrong, but I think when you've had that type of lifestyle, and now at the end of this journey, you're still mentally sharp, but trapped in a failing body, to me, that's gotta be some kind of purgatory. I'm sad that he's gone, but I'm privileged that I knew such a man. With that, I would like to tell Francie and your entire family my deepest condolences. I'm thankful Phil had you all in his life, especially the last few years. I believe it probably gave him purpose, so thank you. Mom, Aunt Rebecca, Uncle Bill, all my cousins and the entire Bat Clan, I'd like to say that I am sorry for your loss. He loved you all very much. Idaho just got a little bit sadder. But I hope you all can find peace knowing wherever he is, it's better. Heck, he's probably up there telling the Lord himself why his onions aren't doing as good as they could be. Wherever he is, I promise you that right, down, right now at this moment, he is looking down with a smile from ear to ear in complete awe and disbelief that so many kind folks came out to say goodbye to little old Peb from Wilder, Idaho. Thank you.
Uh, I'm Benny Sursa, a good friend of Governor Phil Batt, and one of the members of his golfing group, and a Secretary of State and a Deputy Secretary of State, but number one reason I'm here is a good, I'm a good friend of Phil's. It's truly my honor and privilege to be asked to speak today. But I need to recognize a few folks. It's going to be a tough act to follow what we heard today and what Governors Kempthorne, Governor Risch, Governor Otter, and Governor Little did yesterday at the, at the uh, line in state ceremony. Wonderful comments. Also, Bill, Leslie, and Rebecca, my condolences. I need to recognize a few other folks. Francie, you put a capital C on the term caregiver. Your comfort and support sustained Phil for the last eight years. He made it a point to tell me how wonderful you were to him every time I saw him. Eva Gay, the state personnel system had to create a new job title, personal assistant in perpetuity. <laughs> you, you and Jim's friendship and support to Phil over the many years was truly remarkable. And I don't know if you noticed it, but the obituary had a nice paragraph about Jim and Eva Gay Yost being Phil's second family, so to speak. And in her inimitable fashion, Eva Gay left that out. But I'm putting it back in. Thank you. Uh, I know Governor Batt detested long speeches, so my standard line I stole from Governor Kempthorne and that Governor Little uses and I use is, blessed are the brief, for they shall be invited back. Anyway. <laughs> I knew Governor Batt for 50 years, both in and out of government and as a person of compassion, humility, and decency. The last several months at Plantation Place, I visited him regularly. The usual visits with Phil. Right about six, six to seven minutes, he started to get a little restless. You'd shoot the breeze a little, and then he said, thanks for coming, and then you were gone. <laughs> so. Uh, uh, he and my boss, Pete Santa Rosa, were friends for many years and were both mentors to me and were the, my campaign co-chairman. I had, I had uh, Pete and Phil. And when I went around and campaigned, I said, if you don't know me, just judge me by the company I keep, and those two fine gentlemen. But when Pete passed away, I know the, the folks at the Statesman did an editorial about public servants. And I'm going to give them a, a tribute to them, but it, 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 both Pete and Phil epitomized what a public servant is. And this is what the Statesman editorial said, and I'm, most Idahoans prefer their public servants to have a few of these attributes, integrity, honesty, fairness, loyalty, dependability. If their public servants have a long-suffering nature, our understanding, forgiving, and display a sense of humor, that's a bonus. In the event they have also happened to serve their country, honor their party, and champion civil rights, that puts them in the rarest of company. One of my favorite pictures of Governor Batt was at his 95th birthday with Governors Kempthorne, Rish, Otter, and Little. But my favorite picture of the governor which I unfortunately lost on my phone years ago, was at the Plantation Golf Course patio after a round with myself, Governor Batt, and Governor Cecil Andrus with three cans of Coors. Playing golf with Governor Batt and Governor Andrus was truly an interesting experience. I've never seen such intensity from two hackers playing for a $5 side bet. Governor Batt and I had a special fondness for the date of August 4th, 1982. That is the birthday of my son Andrew and Phil's grandson Max. Much to my wife Penny's chagrin, I saw the governor at the hospital and invited him in to the delivery room to say hi. <laughs> Penny was in labor. She and Phil never brought that incident up again. Indulge me while I relate to you a few other remembrances 
uh, that reflect the uniqueness of Phil Bat. I would also recommend to you uh, Rod Grammer's wonderful article uh, recently in the Idaho Press Tribune detailing how we did not just lose a former governor. We lost the singular person who represented the best of us. We lost the conscience of our state. Like many of you here today, I have been on the receiving end of a thorough tongue lashing from Governor Batt and his infamous short temper. During one of our golf outings at River Birch Golf Course, I, in a high-pitched, made a sarcastic comment. I'm sure you find that hard to believe. But I, in a high-pitched voice, made a sarcastic comment about the governor playing the ladies' tees. <laughs> he immediately turned around and gave me a good reprimand. In other words, after he was done, I was missing the part of my anatomy. <laughs> I, of course, indicated that I was just kidding. And we proceeded to play and everything was fine. Two days later, I receive a card in the mail from Governor Bath, apologizing for chewing me out. That was Phil. Jeff Malman indicated to me that such apology cards were not infrequent. Governor Batt was incisive and direct and could, would cut through the BS and get to the point. One of my favorite Phil Batt moments was at the Governor Little's inaugural dinner in January 2019. I moderated, I really didn't, I was there listening, I moderated a roundtable discussion with the governors who were all asked what advice would they give the incoming Governor Little. Governor Batt, after listening to pearls of wisdom, from Dirk, Jim, and Butch, and said three words. Listen to Teresa. He brought the house down. That was vintage Phil Bath. Phil was extremely frugal. Some would say he was a tight, we're in church. But he was also very generous. I remember in September of 97, Pete Santarusa's son Joe was killed in a tragic plane crash. Governor Bath came down to the office and met privately with Pete for an hour which for, Pil for Phil is an eternity. Pete never forgot Phil's compassion and support and indicated to me that Phil made a substantial contribution to the charity the Santa Rosa family created for Joe. Pete told me not to tell anybody what Phil did because Phil wanted it kept quiet. What is Phil's legacy? I think the person who best, could best describe his legacy is Phil himself. At a, at a Lincoln Day banquet, those dreaded events, in, in 2015 at Canyon County, in Phil's words, I was tight, but do I reflect on that as my legacy? No, and the public doesn't either. They'd rather talk about my uphill, successful effort to cover farm laborers with workman's compensation or my contract with the federal government to keep nuclear waste from being stored over the Snake River Aquifer, or my help through monthly meetings transforming Idaho's Indian tribes from being poverty-stricken to moderate recovery. I am proud to be an Idahoan, I'm proud to be a Republican, and I'm proud of my efforts at building this party as a fiscally conservative but welcoming organization that will tolerate social views not glued to history. As you can tell from his remarks, Phil was all about inclusion. The big tent and Ronald Reagan's quote, the person who agrees with you 80% of the time is a friend and an ally, not a 20% traitor. He used that fundamental belief to rebuild the Idaho Republican Party in the early 90s and into its astonishing success since his 94 election. This belief in being inclusive and welcoming is the cornerstone of his legacy and led to one of his greatest honors, having the Wasman Center for Human Rights be named the Philip E. Batt Building. He indicated to me that this honor was special and close to his heart for him being recognized for his work in promoting human rights in Idaho. I could go on and on about Governor Batt, but I think I can hear him getting a little restless, ready to give me one of his repeated lines when I visited him. 
Thanks for coming. See you later. <laughs> it is said we stand on the, sh the shoulders of giants as we look for ways to better the human condition. All of us here today stood on the shoulders of the little giant from Wilder, Philip Eugene Batt. God bless you, Phil. Hello, uh, my name is Mark Cox and I'm Francie's uh, son-in-law, married to her oldest daughter, Nancy. Um, first, I want to say what an honor it is to get the opportunity to say a few words about Mr. Bat. And like many of you in this room, I only had the gift of spending time with the governor for about the last 10 years. And when I say gift, I truly mean our limit time, limited time was just that. In life, you have the chance to meet and spend time with numerous folks. But very few of those experiences fall into the category of a gift. When I first met the governor, I could tell we were going to be great, uh, great friends. He ended up being a bit of a grandfather figure to me because I had lost mine many years prior. Um, as, we, um, as we would get together, um, we could have serious conversations. Uh, we could joke around when the time was right. I would try to uh, help him get up and down and move around, and uh, he would always push me away, as a, as a good grandfather would, like, kid, I don't need your help. Um, <clears throat> but ultimately, we did have a great friendship and mutual respect. As I think about our times together and the human Phil was, there are a number of words that come to mind. Appreciative, humble, modest, empathetic, intelligent, grit, caring, and kindness. What this man always taught me was that loving your spouse and appreciating what they do for you every day is the true core foundation. He also reminded me that no matter what you have accomplished in your life, that there is no room for arrogance. No one person should receive all the praise, and it is always a group of people working together that makes the real impact. Those are the reminders I will take. So I'd like to share a couple quick uh, stories and memories. At the regular family get-togethers, uh, we would drink a cold Coors and talk a little bit about the world of politics. To say he wasn't overly thrilled with the current unrest would be a huge understatement. I would often ask him to give me his thoughts about some topic, and he would say, oh, I really don't know enough to give you much of an opinion. I knew that, I knew that he was very well read and well informed, but he wanted to keep his opinions to himself. With his mind still sharp as a tack, an extreme, an extensive resume, and, more, and a more, uh, more experience than I could ever imagine. He always chose to be humble. I had firsthand experience with his legendary fiscal responsibility. When he decided it was time to sell the famous 2004 Subaru Wagon, also known as the Onion 2, we were in the market for a starter car for a couple of our high school girls. This car had over 200,000 miles on it, and if you had seen it, it had seen a few bumps and bruises. I did my homework and decided what he was asking was just a little too much and uh, just said, hey, I don't think it's going to make sense for us. Well, Phil tried to close me a couple of times on, uh, on why it was worth more than I thought it was and that he had uh, a number of people that were ready to buy it. So ultimately, he relented and we agreed on a bit of a lower price. But, you know, here's this very successful man in his 90s. He, he was going to get every nickel he could out of that car. <laughs> and this was a 2004 Subaru. It wasn't a Mercedes or a BMW. It was clear, though, that he was a very shrewd businessman, and, and success was no accident. Intelligence. One of my favorite stories he told was when Phil started the hops business. It sounded like at the time, the only way to sell hops was through uh, distributors in, in the nation. He felt like his small operation out of, out of Idaho wasn't going to get any real interest. This energetic and fearless man decided the answer was to jump in an airplane and fly to Colorado and meet with Coors directly. 
He showed up on their doorstep, asked for a meeting, and if the story is accurate, he started the first direct um, sales relationship with Coors in the industry. Grit. Phil was so good to our family, but was amazing with our three girls. I remember very early on, right after he married Francie, they came to our house for a barbecue. Our kids were young, and I watched a man in his 80s crawl into a trampoline. <laughs> he didn't pull off any backflips, but he did you know, jump around with three young girls. It was clear to me that, that family and, and kids were super important to him. And it, it just underscored that you don't take yourself too seriously, no matter what you've done in life. He would always comment about what great children we have and what great parents we were. Always kind. As he got older, it became a bit tough for him, for him to be part of the family events. There were lots of kids and noise, which we all know can wear on older folks. Wears on everybody, but older folks. With his hearing starting to go, he would often say with that infectious smile, I can't hear a damn thing you people are talking about. <laughs> and then he would end with a chuckle. I think that was his subtle way of saying, your time is up here, don't let the door hit you on the way out. <laughs> Even though it had become way more challenging for him to be in crowds, he never gave you the sense it was a bother and always made you feel welcome, caring. So to wrap up, I will speak for my entire family when I say we were blessed to have the time we did with Phil. He not only showed our family love and support, but provided an example of what living your best life late in your years can look like. The 96-year-old man that started working at age seven, joined the military, dropped out of college to help his ill father, a successful farmer, an accomplished musician, a loved political figure, and ultimately a kind and humble senior. A great man has passed, yet the impact he has made on the citizens of Idaho, all the way to the Cox family in Eagle, Idaho, will live on. We will miss you, but understand what you are ready, that you are ready for the next phase. We expect as we look up towards those stunning Boise sunsets that you are plowing an onion field, flying your airplane, swinging a golf club, working on a puzzle, or playing your clarinet. And just know we will make sure Francie doesn't spend too much on all the fuss. But rest assured, she will be well taken care of for you. Francie, I met Governor Phil when I first came as pastor here about 11 years ago. And he came in on a Sunday morning and he said, Dwayne. I said, yes, sir. He said, is Steve preaching? I said, no, I am. He said, I'll come back. <laughs> so I say to the governor, don't worry. These are not my words, Phil. These are the words of your friend, Brian Elliott, who had hoped to be with us today, but is not able to be with us today. But Brian wrote this eulogy. He said these things. He said, anyone can display great character in the eyes of people when the eyes of people are focused on them. But only a person with a good heart displays great character in private, personal inter in personal interactions. Phil Bat was one with a good heart. Brian writes, my exposure to Governor Bat came later in his life when he moved into a community that I managed. And as we got to know each other, he would stop by almost weekly for one thing or another, or just a visit, sometimes a complaint, sometimes recognition of an employee, occasionally politics, and sometimes he would invite me to his weekly golf game. And sometimes our visits were about spiritual things. Brian writes, Phil expressed a faith in God that reflected a heart changed by God. When we are born with a heart, it often has an indication to think only of ourselves, to grab what we can, to climb over others, to serve ourselves, to be proud, to be boasting and selfish. So why was Phil's heart good? Phil expressed to me a faith in God that reflected a heart changed by God. In Romans, in the New Testament, we read, 
Because you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you, you will be saved. Brian writes, characteristics of a good heart. Phil's actions flowed from a heart of living water that has changed his life of faith through the grace of God. You've heard testimonies today from many others. You've read maybe even more of how some of those God-like characteristics were alive in Phil's life. A good heart. Behaviors like compassion, honesty, and humility. He said, I never had to question Phil's honesty, as a matter of fact. I came to depend on it. He was a straight shooter, and even though he may not have all perspectives, he told you what he thought including when he'd have to admit he was wrong about something. He was not invested in, in always being right, but he was committed to doing the right things. His honesty carried on into his many years of service with the state, whether it was about people or finances, his honesty and integrity have echoed through these past days. Brian quotes Dan Popke saying, he didn't like waste. He didn't like wasted words, wasted money, or wasted lives. Humility. If I hadn't known that Phil had been governor when I met him, I would have assumed he was just a humble, hardworking onion farmer who enjoyed life and enjoyed people. He was easy to talk to, easy to like and respect. What you see is what you got. I remember one day when my wife and I had gone to the Boise Hawks baseball game, and here comes Phil walking through the stands, clarinet in hand, playing to everyone's delight. It was not an announced feature. It was just Phil enjoying everyday common life, people, people he loved. Phil had high standards. He held you, to ac held you accountable to those standards, but also held himself to those standards. And if he failed... He was quick to apologize. In my community, he, there were several times during one of his drop-in visits with me when he would express regrets and apologize for angry words or wrong actions. And I know he did the same with others, with staff members who would re relate the conversation of a note or apology given. It takes a good heart of, of humility to recognize your error and ask for forgiveness and make it right. And Phil did that. Compassion. Phil displayed a good heart full of compassion. He cared for those who worked for him, for human rights, for the respect and dignity that all deserve. He championed workers' compensation for migrant workers. He, was the one, he did what was right out of compassion for the underdog. Brian quotes Rod Grammer. He said, as a young man, Phil dropped out of a club when a friend of his who was of Japanese descent was rejected because of his race. He never went back. And then he said, that showed to me not only what he did as a political leader for human rights, but in his own personal life, he walked the talk. Phil spent time with his young family in Wilder, with excursions and friends and trips to the mountains. He adopted without hesitation Francie's new family. His stepdaughter Mo wrote this in a tribute to him. Mostly, I will remember you for the way that you loved, without apology, without hesitation, without judgment. Thank you for loving my mama, my babies, and our entire family. Honesty, humility, compassion, faith, a good heart. Brian ends with these words. So Phil, Governor, Governor Batt, Lieutenant Governor, Senator, Representative, Husband, Leader, Boss, Co-worker, Father, Stepfather, Grandfather, Friend, Neighbor, Child of God. Well done. Good and faithful servant. Thanks be to God.
make me shout too. Let's pray together. Thank you, God, for a life well lived. Thank you, God, for friends and family that gather with us and hold us in these tender times. Thank you, God, for, for laughter, for memories that flood our mind, 
for tears that roll down our cheeks because we love. We release from this earth your servant, your child, your creation, Phil. God, welcome him home, raise him up with your people until we meet again. It's in the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen.
just after the service, the family would like to invite you to greet them. They'll be in the fellowship hall, so out to the right and follow the signs, and you can greet them and continue conversations, share memories, share laughter, be support. There's not many funerals you attend where you leave thinking, I need to be a better person. But this was one of them, wasn't it? Oh, that we might be better people. Would you receive this benediction? Friends, may the peace of Jesus Christ go with you wherever God leads you. May God walk with you in the wilderness. May God hold you in the storms of life. May God bring you home rejoicing at the amazing things you've experienced together. May God bring you home rejoicing once again through these doors in the name of Christ. Amen. Governor Bad's family being led out now of the Cathedral of the Rockies. And thank you for joining us for this memorial honoring the incredible legacy of former Governor Phil Bat, ending there with a song actually written by the governor. He'll now be taken to a cemetery there in his hometown of Wilder and laid to rest surrounded by family and friends. We'll have more on his influence that is still felt throughout the state on our news at four. The news at noon starts in just a moment here on Idaho's News Channel 7. <laughs>